continuing to uh, have our series exploring various idols of the heart. Hopefully the volume's okay. It feels a little loud, but is it all right? Okay. All right. Uh, well, yeah, as Pastor Daniel kind of mentioned last week, uh, so often, you know, we can have such a hard time seeking after Christ, which is our theme for the year, uh, because we're so busy seeking after all sorts of other things. Uh, now, more often than not, these other things that we seek after tend to be good things. But the problem arises when we elevate good things to become ultimate things. And when that happens, uh, we end up falling for the trap of idolatry. And Pastor Daniel last week kind of introduced us to the idol of family and relationships. Uh, well, today we'll be looking at uh, another idol of the heart, and that's the idol of comfort. Now, um, comfort in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, after all, it's nice to be comfortable. Now, it's nice not having to be stressed. It's nice enjoying leisure. Uh, but when comfort becomes an idol, we end up pursuing after comfort for things that only God can ultimately provide for us. Things like joy and meaning and security. And I think the allure of comfort as an idol has actually kind of grown uh, in recent years. Uh, I've noticed a very interesting shift take place where, whereas maybe before in the mid-2010s, uh, the dominant culture, the dominant kind of attitude was rise and grind, right? Put in your 70, 80, 90 hours of work each week, push through and make your dreams come true, right? This was the era of motivational speakers, the era of life coaches. This was the era of crushing it, killing it, right? This is all about the hustle culture. But interestingly, over the past couple of years, I've seen this general shift away from hustle culture and more so towards this, this culture of comfort, it's not comfort. And here's just some examples of this shift that I've kind of observed. Uh, observed. Uh, maybe you've uh, heard of the term quiet quitting in the workplace. Uh, now, if you don't know what this term means, quiet quitting simply refers to doing the bare minimum at work just to get by. So no more sh uh, showing up to work early, no more staying late, no more volunteering for things that are not your official responsibilities. I'm just here to collect my paycheck and not to be bothered while doing so. Let me just comfortably get through this job. Uh, another term that kind of points towards this shift of comfort culture uh, is slacktivism. Maybe you've heard this term before. Uh, but slacktivism is the practice of supporting a, a political campaign or a social cause uh, in a way that requires very minimal effort. Very often just by engaging on social media and kind of leaving it at that. Uh, we like, we comment, we share, and we feel like we've done our civic duty. And we can pursue justice and fight against inequality all from the comforts of our living room sofas. Uh, just one last term that kind of exemplifies this shift towards comfort culture uh, is the term ghosting. Uh, now, kind of with the, the rise of popularity with online dating, uh, ghosting has kind of uh, grown in popularity as well. And so ghosting, if you don't know, uh, is when you just stop responding to someone because you're no longer interested in them or you no longer care to go on another date with them. And the reason why you do that is because it's much more comfortable, it's much more convenient to just ignore someone than to have an uncomfortable conversation with them, right? To tell them, hey, you lied on your dating profile. You said that you're 5'10", but actually you're, you're more like 5'8", maybe like 5'7 without your shoes on, right? Or you're just not as interesting to me. I, I don't see a future with you. Rather than having an uncomfortable conversation, we can just ghost them. Right, these are just some examples of this more recent shift towards comfort culture. I can just go on with example after example, like the obsession with retiring early and just leisurely traveling the world, um, rising consumer and credit card debt, all right? declining birth rates, delayed marriage, load management in sports, the looming volunteer apocalypse as baby boomers are starting to age out, massive declines in church attendance and church engagement. And yes, while there are multiple factors driving these trends, I can't help but to observe that underneath a lot of these trends is also this desire for comfort. I just want to be comfortable, man. Like, stop asking me to do so much. I just want to get by without much stress, without many responsibilities. Just let me be comfortable. And maybe for you and I, maybe we too feel this pull towards comfort in our own lives as well. And again, while comfort in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing, comfort can become an idol if we're not careful. See, we can find ourselves looking to comfort in order to meet the deepest longings of our hearts. And so uh, here are some indicators that might possibly reveal that comfort is becoming an idol in your own life. Uh, see, comfort may be an idol in our lives if, number one, we fearfully run from any commitments. 
If we find ourselves constantly avoiding being tied down in any way or to anyone, we may be pursuing comfort as an idol. Because after all, when you commit to someone or when you commit to something, you are choosing to potentially be uncomfortable. You're choosing to to not run away when things get tough. You're promising to stick it through instead of jumping from job to job or church to church or community to community or city to city or relationship to relationship. Comfort may be an idol if we find ourselves fearfully running from any commitments. Uh, Secondly, comfort may become an idol in our lives if we selfishly avoid any and all sacrifices. If we find ourselves always sidestepping any kind of cost, we may be pursuing comfort as an idol in our lives. Now, sure, we'd love to reap all the benefits of being a part of a community, being part of a church, being in a relationship, having a family, but don't ask me to do too much. I'll only engage as long as the costs don't outweigh the benefits. See, comfort may be an idol in our lives if we selfishly avoid any and all sacrifices. Uh, Thirdly, comfort may be an idol in our lives if we mindlessly entertain distractions. If we find ourselves constantly seeking to escape the difficulties of life by numbing ourselves with a never-ending stream of diversions, we may be pursuing comfort as an idol. Right? We scroll, we binge, we veg out, we find ourselves deep in the YouTube algorithm, and we do so because we don't want to think about life. Right? We want to have our minds not thinking about something else besides the realities of life. Comfort may be an idol if we find ourselves mindlessly entertaining distractions. Lastly, comfort may be an idol in our lives if we endlessly pursue after leisure, if we find ourselves incessantly chasing after the next experience, the next bite of food, the next shopping spree, right, the next relationship, the next TV series, the next vacation, the next thing, thinking that that's what will bring ultimate satisfaction and fulfillment to our lives, we may be pursuing comfort as an idol. Now, I would venture to say that that most, uh, that many, if not most of us in this room are very hardworking people, And maybe we think to ourselves that that comfort as an idol is not really a thing for us, right? Maybe we feel the need to kind of pat ourselves on the back and be like, come on now. This sermon isn't for me. Come on, Josh. I I make sacrifices. I keep my commitments. I haven't taken a vacation in years. I'm not about the comfortable life. That's not me. And yes, we do work hard. We do make sacrifices. We do keep our commitments. And I think, though, that the reality for many of us is though that we work hard not so much to, to glorify God or to do good to our neighbors. But honestly, for a lot of us, we work so hard because we want to eventually be comfortable. We want to eventually secure that big paycheck. We want to eventually live that nice retirement. We want to eventually buy that nice home. We want to eventually be comfortable. And when that magical day comes, whenever that day may be, when we can just sit back and relax, oh, we will adamantly say no to any and all kinds of commitments and sacrifices, and we will enthusiastically say yes to endless leisure and distractions. See, in these ways, whether directly or indirectly, we can find ourselves chasing after comfort. But here's the thing. See, comfort as an idol is not the answer to the deepest longings of our hearts. See, we may look to comfort to find meaning, security, hope, joy, but we won't find what we're looking for. Comfort as an idol will always disappoint. See, when you never commit to anything, you remain untethered, and you will find yourself aimlessly drifting from one thing to the next, which ultimately leaves you feeling isolated and anxious. See, when you run away from making any kinds of sacrifice, you will actually miss out on the things that make life richly beautiful, things like raising a family, Things like making a difference, things like getting excellent at your job, things like mastering a skill, things like building a community, because those kind of things always require sacrifice. See, when you mindlessly entertain distractions, you end up exchanging true joy for cheap substitutes that fail to really satisfy. I mean, let's be real. How many of us even remember the 50 TikTok videos or YouTube shorts or Instagram reels that we sat an hour scrolling through last night? Man, I don't remember any of those things. Right? We, we, uh, we exchange true joy for chief substitutes. And when we endlessly pursue after leisure, we find ourselves needing to constantly jump from one thing to the next thing in order to shield ourselves from the ever-encroaching boredom and dissatisfaction. See, comfort as an idol is depressingly disappointing. It actually leads us into isolation. It robs us of living a meaningful life. It strips us of true joy. 
and it perpetuates dissatisfaction. But thankfully, Jesus offers a better way. The gospel points to a better way forward. And there's two things I want to point out here, two ways that Jesus dismantles our idolatry of comfort. The first thing is this, number one, it might sound a little countercultural, but Jesus actually invites us into discomfort. Jesus actually calls us into situations and seasons that make us uncomfortable. Jesus himself leads us into heartaches, into difficulties, into challenging circumstances, into inconvenience. After all, Jesus says, whoever would follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and then follow me. Now, last time I checked, denying yourself is not very comfortable. Crucifixion is not very comfortable. See, Jesus invites us into discomfort. Now, the question is, why? Why? Because I think a lot of us have this kind of underlying assumption that Jesus exists to make our lives comfortable. Right, to fulfill all of our hopes and dreams, to answer all of our prayers, to bless all of our plans. Jesus, you exist to make my life comfortable, right? Well, why then does Jesus invite us into discomfort? Well, I think there's two broad reasons why Jesus does so. And the first reason why Jesus invites us into discomfort, number one, is to carry out his internal work of maturation in our lives. See, one of the primary ways that Jesus does his work of transformation in our lives is by leading us into situations and seasons that make us uncomfortable. The reality is there is no maturing without discomfort. That's, that's true of physical exercise. That's true of any relationship. That's true of learning anything new. And that's especially true of becoming more like Jesus. I take, for example, what, what it says in James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. There, the apostle James writes, Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. Why? Here's why. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect or mature and complete, lacking in nothing. We see here that rather than being obstacles to avoid, the, the trials of life that make us feel uncomfortable are actually opportunities to embrace. Here, James writes, count it all joy when your life is filled with all kinds of things, seasons, and situations that make you feel uncomfortable. Now, here's what we have to keep in mind. James, this apostle, is not writing from a place of privilege. He's not writing from an ivory tower where life is easy and enjoyable. No, James is writing from a place of deep personal experience with suffering in his own life. And in this letter, he's writing to dear friends, other Jewish Christians, who themselves are also experiencing deep personal suffering in their lives. And so here, James knows what it looks like to be uncomfortable. These words are not meant to be a shallow Christian cliche that we just kind of throw around, but these words are meant to be deep encouragement for those who find themselves very uncomfortable. And so with fullness of conviction, he says, consider it pure joy when you are going through all sorts of trials. Why? Because Jesus himself is at work through those trials to mature you. Jesus himself is at work through discomfort to grow you, to refine you, to strengthen you. Right? Ask any person who is mature in their faith. Right? Maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a mentor, maybe it's someone at this church. Right? Ask them. Ask them if their life has been smooth sailing. And I guarantee you that they will say no. They've been through a thousand different trials, but they've come out on the other side stronger. See, Jesus invites us into discomfort in order to grow us in our character, to mature us in our faith, to strip away our arrogant self-reliance, to soften our hearts towards others who may be going through similar things, to teach us what it means to be humble and dependent, to strengthen our convictions, to transform us to look more and more like him. There is no maturity apart from discomfort. Now, uh, just to maybe share it in a different light, uh, it's interesting because I think modern-day psychologists now are finally catching up to what the Bible has been saying for the past 2,000 years. Just as an example, uh, there's a book called The Coddling of the American Mind. It's written by two social psychologists by the name of Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff. And in their book, they make a very interesting insight that echoes what we see to be true here in the book of James. 
Uh, see, um, they, they say that we tend to label things as either fragile or durable. Now, fragile things require a lot of protection because they can break easily, whereas durable things don't require as much protection because they don't break as easily. Now, um, regardless of whether something is fragile or durable, though, both things require protection, right? You, you don't want them to break. And so maybe you'll wrap it in bubble wrap when you move it, right? Maybe you'll take care of it. Maybe you'll make sure that it is safe and sound. Now, as social psychologists, these two, uh, these two people, they ask the question, okay, what about humans, though? Right? Are, are humans fragile or are humans durable? Now, this is actually a trick question <laughs> because humans don't actually fit in either of those categories. See, through their research, they confirm that humans are what they call anti-fragile. Now, I know there's a famous K-pop song right now called like, anti-fragile. Like, don't think about that, right? But what they mean by anti-fragile is that humans actually need to face difficulties and trials and discomfort to grow. See, being shielded from all kinds of adversity is actually antithetical and even harmful to human maturity and flourishing. See, God has designed us to be anti-fragile. And as such, we are to embrace discomfort as opportunities for growth. Discomfort is the very means by which Jesus does his internal work of maturation in our lives. And that's why he invites us to be uncomfortable. Well, secondly, Jesus also invites us into discomfort because he also wants to carry out his missional work of multiplication through our lives. Second reason. See, one of the main ways that Jesus accomplishes his mission of making disciples of all nations, of having the gospel go out to every corner of creation, of seeing his work of renewal expand all over the place, is by inviting his people to partner with him in this challenging work. There is no completing the mission. There is no multiplying disciples without discomfort. In fact, Jesus says in John chapter 12, verse 24, he writes, or he says, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, of course, in this context, Jesus is primarily referring to his own sacrificial death on the cross, through which he will secure life for his people. But here, I think Jesus is also laying down a general principle for all of his disciples to follow as well. After all, just a few verses later, he says, If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. See, this principle of, of sacrifice giving way to fruit, of dying to yourself leading to life for others, is not just true of Jesus, but it's also true of all of us who would choose to follow after Jesus. Unless a seed dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it will bear much fruit. In other words, if you are a disciple of Christ, you are called to embrace discomfort as Jesus carries out his missional work of multiplication through your life. That's the way the gospel will go forth and bear much fruit. I mean, think about in your own life how the gospel came to you. See, for you to have heard the gospel, for you to have received new life in Christ, someone had to sacrifice. Someone had to be uncomfortable. Now, first and foremost, that person was Jesus himself, who took on ultimate discomfort by going to the cross, and through his death, we now have life in him. But subsequently, there have been a lot of other people who have had to experience discomfort in order for the gospel to get to you, whether that was the discomfort of inconvenience, or sacrifice, or persistence, or potential rejection, they've had to embrace discomfort so that you yourself would experience life in Christ. I mean, for myself, when I think about all it took for me to receive the gospel, it's quite astonishing just how many people have had to embrace discomfort. See, in the late 1800s, missionaries made their first attempts to enter into Korea to bring the gospel. Now, Korea at the time was known as the hermit kingdom because they were so hostile against foreigners. And so many of these missionaries lost their lives trying to bring the gospel into this country. But eventually, by God's grace, the gospel broke through. Well, a few generations later, in the 1980s, my dad immigrated to the United States. Now, at the time, he was not a Christian. And so he was here on a student visa, didn't know anyone, had no place to stay, but all that he had was an address, and that address was to this church, to OMC. Now, OMC was started because the founding pastor 
had heard the gospel through those early missionaries decades ago. And with conviction in his heart, he started this church. And so my dad gets off the plane at LAX, takes a taxi all the way to this church. He knocks on the door. The pastor opens it and says, hey, what do you need? I'm a student here. I don't know anyone. I don't have a place to stay. The pastor says, hey, why don't you stay with me and my family for a little while until you find a place to live? So my dad took him on his offer, and that's how he eventually heard the gospel and became a Christian. Well, pretty soon, my dad met my mom at this church. But that was only possible because there were people at OMC who were willing to provide rides for college students. Kind, selfless volunteers willing to drive from K-Town to Westwood week after week after week to provide rides for people who needed it. And my mom was one of those people who got picked up and dropped off week after week. Well, eventually, my parents got married, and I was born, and I grew up at this church. And in the fifth grade, my Sunday school teacher, Isaac Teacher, He clearly explained the gospel to me. And because this person was willing to sacrifice his time in order to hang out with a bunch of 10-year-olds on his weekends to share with them about who Jesus is, I came to know Christ as my Lord and Savior. See, all along the way, people had to embrace discomfort in order for there to be missional multiplication. Missionaries lost their lives. OMC's founding pastor lost the comfort of having his own home. Right? These volunteer drivers, they lost their gas money. My Sunday school teacher, he lost his free time. But that discomfort has led to life because unless a seed dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus invites us into discomfort in order to carry out his work of missional multiplication through our lives. Can I just emphasize this? See, nearly everything in life that will further the mission of Christ, nearly everything in life that will advance the gospel, that will advance Christ's kingdom, will be uncomfortable. Sharing the gospel is uncomfortable. Discipling the next generation is uncomfortable. Raising up a family to know Jesus is uncomfortable. Working through marital conflict is uncomfortable. Working with excellence at your job is uncomfortable. Being hospitable and generous with your time and money is uncomfortable. Dying to yourself to serve others is uncomfortable. Reconciling with that friend is uncomfortable. Seeking Christ first is uncomfortable. But these are the very things that Jesus invites us into because these uncomfortable things are the very means by which missional multiplication takes place. This is how we see the kingdom advance. This is how we see the gospel go forth. This is how we see disciples of Christ raised up. And that's why Jesus invites us into discomfort. So we've seen so far that contrary to our common assumptions, Jesus does not exist to make our lives comfortable. The reality is Jesus actually invites us into discomfort. This is his way of carrying out his internal work of maturation as well as his missional work of multiplication. And hopefully that that encourages us to stop making comfort the ultimate goal for our lives. But to this, uh, let me just add one more encouraging reason because sometimes we can hear this and be like, okay, fine, I guess the Christian life is just going to suck. We've got to suck it up and just move on, right? But let me just add one encouraging reason for us for why we can end our idolatrous chase for comfort. And that's because, number two, Jesus provides us with true comfort. See, unlike the flimsy and fleeting comforts we try to cobble together for ourselves, which actually just deplete us of life, Jesus offers us true and lasting comfort, which carries us through all the challenges of life. See, even as Jesus leads us into difficult, uncomfortable seasons and situations, he never leaves us empty-handed, but he always gives us true comfort. As Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 27, This is right before he's about to go to the cross. He knows his disciples are going to be in a world of pain. They're going to be confused. He's no longer going to be physically present with them. This is what he says in John 14, 27. He says, peace, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. So let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Again, here, Jesus is reassuring his disciples that even though they will face some incredibly difficult things once he is no longer physically present with them, he is promising to not leave them empty-handed. He promises them his peace. 
He promises them true comfort. And this peace, this comfort is not as the world gives. See, the kind of comfort that the world gives is never secure. It is never enough. It is fleeting and it is flimsy. If you try to secure comfort through your stock portfolio, what happens when a recession hits? What happens if your investments tank? If you try to secure comfort through your job performance or your accomplishments, then what happens when you fail to perform? What happens when they hire someone who is younger, smarter, hungrier, more willing to sacrifice than you are? If you try to secure comfort through your material possessions, what happens when your stuff gets old? What happens when you can no longer afford to buy those things anymore? If you try to secure your comfort through relationships, what happens if you break up? What happens if you divorce? What happens if those friendships grow apart? See, the kind of comfort that is found in the world is flimsy and fleeting at best. And even more sadly, when you settle for the world's comfort, you actually miss out on the true comfort that is only found in Christ. See, the kind of comfort that Jesus provides leads to a true peace. And there's a couple of things I just want us to point out here in John 14, 27. See, first of all, this is a comfort that calms troubled hearts. It's a comfort that meets us in the middle of our mess. It's not a superficial comfort that just plays happy music, that calls us to have positive thoughts and forces us to just quickly move on with life. But this is the kind of comfort that sits with us in our grief. This is the kind of comfort that that weeps with us in the face of failures and discouragement. This is the kind of comfort that, that lingers with us when we get that horrible call from the doctor's office that leaves our heart fallen to the ground. This is the kind of comfort that Jesus provides as the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our afflictions. It's a comfort that that calms our troubled hearts. Secondly, we read in John 14 that his comfort also casts out all fear. It's a comfort that reassures us not only in the midst of present pain, but also in the face of a fearful future. It's a comfort that guides us when we're confronted with uncertainty, when we have a tough decision to make, when we don't know what the future has in store for us, we need not fear because Jesus as the good shepherd will guide us all the way. He is working all things together for our good and he will safely lead us home. His comfort casts out all fear. And lastly, we read in John 14 that this comfort comes with his presence. This comfort is not something that Jesus just gives to us apart from himself. But this comfort is found in himself. See, it's interesting because Jesus promises this comfort to his disciples in the context of promising them the Holy Spirit. In the previous verse, in John 14, verse 26, Jesus says, hey, when I go, the Holy Spirit's going to come. And he calls the Holy Spirit, in the original Greek, he calls the Holy Spirit the parakletos. Now, that can be translated in all kinds of ways, advocate, counselor, But one of the ways that parakletos can be translated is also the comforter. When I leave, you don't need to be afraid. I'm going to give you my peace. And the way that you're going to experience my peace is through the Holy Spirit, this parakletos, the comforter. And through the Holy Spirit, you're going to experience my presence every step of the way. And when you know that Jesus is with you every step of the way, there's nothing to fear. You can stand firm through anything. It's kind of like this. Um, I've shared this story before, so apologies to those who are hearing this again. Um, But as a kid, uh, like many of you, uh, I was forced, not asked, but I was forced to take piano lessons. And I hated it, right, because I'm not very musically gifted whatsoever. And so every piano lesson was like super stressful. In fact, it was so stressful that eventually my mom (laughs) agreed to having me no longer take piano lessons. I was like, oh, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, like no more piano lessons for me. But before I quit piano lessons, I had to do the piano recital. Now, every kid who's ever had to do a piano recital knows how, how terrible it is, right? You walk into a room, it's filled with all kinds of strangers and adults, and they look bored out of their mind because, let's be honest, the kids who play these piano songs are not very good. And on top of that, like, they're not there for you. They're there for their own kids. and so They're just kind of waiting to pass the time until they can have like their 30 seconds of hearing their son or daughter play this piece of music. And so everyone looks bored out of their minds. No one looks happy to be there. And so I'm there on the day of my piano recital, and I am nervous. My hands are, are shaking. My hands are sweaty. It's finally my turn. So I get up on stage. I sit at the piano bench, and I can't bring myself to play. 
Right? Even though I practiced this piece, like literally, like a hundred times, I could not bring myself to play my piece in that moment. And I was ready to step off the stage, and I was about to do so until I turned my head. And my mom's right there, but there in the audience, I saw my mom. And I saw her uh, reassuring nod, hey, you got this. Uh, I saw her encouraging smile, hey, it's okay. Uh, I saw the look on her face that said, I paid a lot of money for this son. Like, you better play. Like, don't embarrass me in front of my friends. But when I saw who was present, I was able to play. When I saw who was there, I was able to get through the recital. See, when we feel afraid and overwhelmed with what's in front of us, we can take comfort knowing who's right next to us. Jesus is our ultimate comfort. And as he has given himself to us through the Holy Spirit, our hearts can be at peace and we need not fear. He provides us with true comfort even in the midst of our present pains and even in the face of an uncertain future. His presence calms our troubled hearts and his presence casts out all fears. Jesus provides us with true comfort. So church, we've seen that Jesus dismantles our idolatrous pursuit of comfort by inviting us into discomfort and by serving as our true comfort. And so instead of seeking after and settling for the flimsy and fleeting comforts of this world, would you seek Christ first? Would you say yes when Jesus invites you into seasons and situations that are uncomfortable, trusting that he is doing so for your good, he's maturing you? And he's carrying out his missional work of multiplication through you. And would you trust in him if you find yourself in such a season where you do feel overwhelmed, where you do feel afraid, where you are uncomfortable? Would you look to Christ as your true comfort, the one who is with you every step of the way? Uh, you can bow your heads with me at this time. We'll spend some time in prayer and reflection as we respond to God's word together. Um, uh, church, would you just take a moment to have the truth of God's word just land on your hearts. Um, some of us have been so busy chasing after worldly comfort, and we want so badly to have a life of ease and, and leisure with no commitments and no sacrifice, and we think that we can find this ultimate joy and, and security in comfort. Friends, would you know that Jesus offers a better way? And so if Jesus is inviting you into a season of discomfort right now, would you respond in faith and would you trust in him? And if you find yourself in a season that troubles your heart and fills you with fear, would you also respond in faith and trust in him? Let's look to Jesus who is our true comfort. Let's spend some time in prayer as we respond to God's word together. Let's pray.